I'm Jonathan Beaver. I'm a relatively new postdoctoral scholar in the Rock Ethics Institute. And I'm really pleased to be here as part of this series. I wanted to thank my colleague Nikolai and the staff of the Rock, Rob Peeler, Deb Triolanis, and Carolyn Umbrick for helping to organize. And I also want to thank Doug and Julie Rock for their ongoing support of the Rock of the our work here at the Rock Ethics Institute. It's my great pleasure and our great pleasure to welcome Alan Hornblum back to Penn State. Mr. Hornblum, a Philadelphia native, left an academic track to become a widely known, widely respected author and chronicler of human subjects abuses in medical and research settings. Hornblum has degrees from Penn State, Villanova, and Temple Universities, and has worked in a variety of professional contexts, including the Pennsylvania prison system as a literary instructor, not an inmate, to be clear, and as a political organizer. Hornblum has lectured widely in academic, medical, and community contexts on now six books, beginning with his 1999 Acres of Skin, a book on the history and extent of prison medical experiments. Sentence to Science, his fourth book, is available from our very own Penn State University Press. Most recently, Hornblum has written Against Their Will on the history of medical experimentation involving children, about which he'll speak tonight. Joining him, him this evening as a special guest, Mr. Gordon Shattuck, who made the journey down from Boston here to be with us. And I'll let um, Mr. Hornblum introduce Mr. Shattuck during his remarks. So we'll have about 45 to 50 minutes of comments and plenty of time for questions and conversation at the end. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alan Hornblum. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, I want to thank the Rock Institute. And I want to thank Penn State. I could have given this talk at Michigan or Northwestern or Ohio State or uh, Minnesota, but I figured I might as well start at the top, right? So we started at State College. And I actually uh, preceded you by a few years. Uh, I was like you, uh, sitting in some uh, boring classes which is the reason that I spent more time on the athletic field than in uh, Petit or any of the classrooms. Uh, I recommend you do not follow that track, otherwise you'll end up like me working in the Philadelphia prison system. Uh, and it's actually through that experience that I am here talking to you now. Uh, I had just picked up a uh, master's degree in history at Villanova, wasn't much older than you. And what does degrees in history entitle you to? And that's to work in our penal system in America. So I worked through the 1970s in the Philly prison system. And one of the things that first hit me walking in that first day on a very hot uh, September morning were scores and scores of inmates strapped and wrapped in bandages and adhesive tape and medical gauze. And I was thinking to myself, my God, is this place that unsafe? Maybe I shouldn't be working here. Uh, I figured it was a knife fight on a cell block or a gang war in the, uh, the prison yard. And the next day, I asked the guard, what's the story with all these guys, you know, with the wounds and the, uh, the tape and everything? And he said, oh, that's nothing. That's just uh, an experiment. Uh, they're doing perfume tests for the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, what? And he repeated himself, and I, it just didn't register because there were a couple thousand fairly uh, unclean, smelly prisoners, and it just didn't make sense that they're doing perfume studies. You know, Arpege Lanvin in, in the Holmesburg prison? Nah. Uh, and I continued to pepper the guard with questions about that experience. And he finally got tired of me asking questions and said, look, Mr. Hornblum, you're new here, not the experiments. They've been going on for 20 years. For 20 years, they had been using prisoners as test subjects. I had never seen a clinical trial, small or large. And quite frankly, at that time, as I came to find out, that clinical trial in Philadelphia in the prisons was probably the largest clinical trial in American history. In fact, Holmesburg Prison and the other two prisons were probably the largest human experimentation factory America's ever had. And I would ask questions to the inmates who came into my classes, because I was running a literacy program. And they'd come in strapped and wrapped in strange things on their heads and their bodies and what have you. 
and they told me it was this test and they're doing it for this much money and I would see the problems they had and the scars and the rashes and, and what have you. And it rubbed me wrong from the very first hour I saw it. And I always thought that there would be a Jonathan Beaver or some other professor, some other scholar, some other journalist, medical ethicist who would write the story of what was happening there because I knew something not kosher was taking place. But everybody bought into it. The inmates, the staff, the administration, widespread, long time operation. And I'm giving you this preface because that's how I get to the story now dealing with children. Many years later, not the 1980s, but the 1990s, I'm running the sheriff's office of Philadelphia. I'm still coming in contact with a lot of those criminals who I knew back in the 70s. And I decided to interview some of these guys, and I interviewed more, and I went to other prisons, and I tracked down guys on the street, and I'm taking their stories, and they're telling me about these experiments. They're telling me about the impact. They're telling me about the repercussions. They're telling me the money they made, so forth and so on. I then started tracking down the doctors. The doctors, interestingly enough, would not talk. When I would get them on the phone, they would hang up. They would curse me out. They would admit they'd been hiding from this for 30 years. They'd plead with me not to reopen it. Some said, I won't talk to you unless I can have a lawyer present. That's what I was getting. So on the one hand, I have test subjects willing to talk, but didn't know what they were being used for or as. The other hand, I have the doctors and researchers who knew what were going on, but afraid to talk. Obviously, it only whet my appetite to the point that I did something very stupid. I gave up my job, and it was a great job. Had a gun, had a badge, had a car, parked on City Hall, had 300 deputies under me, but I became so wedded to that story and figuring out what took place, I was ready to go on a suicide mission. And in some ways it was, because I was really uh, taking a jump off the precipice economically. I was just doing some part-time college teaching and uh, going through my funds. And I tracked down a lot of information, got a lot of documents through the Freedom of Information Act, going to the FBI, the CIA, the Army, the, the Pentagon, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, all sorts of organizations, and I'm starting to build the story. And it's through those documents and all of the medical journals that I went into that I start to get the story of the history of using prisoners as inmates. And that's where the book Acres of Skin comes from. Some of you got excited. You probably thought, you know, it's a recommended pornography book that I should pick up. Uh, it would have sold better if it was pornography. It was on prisoners as test subjects. Took five years, comes out in 98. But the documents that I'm collecting, the medical journals that I'm going through, guess what I'm finding that I was also unprepared to have? Repeated instances of doctors and researchers using children, institutionalized children, as guinea pigs for medical experiments. And I told this one physician, the, the lone physician who was supportive of this campaign that I was on, about what I was finding. He said he knew of some of it, and he encouraged me to pursue it. He said, Alan, that will be your next book. After you do the one on prisoners, you're going to do the one on children. And I wasn't quite ready for that. Actually, I wanted to take a step away from five years on this whole business. And I have subsequently written other books dealing with organized crime, dealing with Soviet espionage. But I did eventually come back to it. And that's where we get the book uh, Against Their Will. It's the history of using institutionalized children as raw material for medical experimentation. And I think you'll be hearing things here that you have never heard before. You may blanch, you may be upset, you may disbelieving. I encourage you to check me out and do your own research on it. 
because there are more stories like this out there. We may have some budding journalists here or some budding historians who want to break some new ground themselves and like to do research the way you would if you're tracking down some criminals, because I had to use the same skills in locating the information in the people and tracking down people like Gordon, who was used as a test subject. And a lot of my story deals with institutions like this. Institutions like Vineland and Fernald, Sonoma State, Hamburg. Vineland is in South Jersey, Fernald, Massachusetts, Sonoma State, California. Hamburg is in Pennsylvania. And these were where doctors involved in research went. They went there because they knew they could get what they wanted. And what did they want? They wanted docile, inexpensive test subjects. And they went to these institutions on a regular basis whenever they wanted to do a cl clinical trial. And they were given the green light by the superintendent, by the medical director. There may be some instances where a doctor or superintendent said no, but more than likely they said yes. Rentham, also in Massachusetts, Penhurst, southeastern Pennsylvania, Letchworth Village in New York. These were facilities that held damaged people, individual who had some de developmental disability. All sorts of terms were used. We still use the term retarded. Not too many people blanch. But it was even worse decades ago when the term feeble-minded was used. And most of these institutions, at their origination and construction, were called the New Jersey State Colony for the Feeble-Minded at Vineland, the New Jersey State Colony for the Feeble-Minded at Rentham or at Fernald, the Sonoma State Facility for the Feeble-Minded. The Feeble-Minded was anybody who had some sort of problem. OK, it could be a very serious, significant one, such as cerebral palsy, or it could be as minor as somebody who was shy. They could be mute. They could be blind. They could have some sort of serious brain damage. Everything was in this wide spectrum, including maybe uh, they uh, had some criminal uh, past. They had been arrested maybe an individual, a female uh, unwed mother. It did not take much to get you thrown in one of these facilities. Some cases, the, the individuals were in very bad shape and had to be tended to around the clock. In other cases, they could be just like yourself. You would not notice them if, as being unusual, even if you pass them 10 or 12 times on the street. Charles Davenport was one of the major figures of the American eugenics movement. He's born in Brooklyn, comes from a fairly well-off family. He gets a PhD in uh, biology. He's very much interested in heredity. He teaches at Harvard and the University of Chicago. And he is a strident individual who buys into the eugenics movement that starts originally in England in the 1880s, but very quickly moves to this shore. And it makes a lot of headway around the country because of people like Davenport, who are aggressively pushing the notion that you have some great people who have great genes, and they should propagate, and we need more doctors, need more scholars, need more authors, need more musicians. They are the people that the country wants. Those at the other end of the spectrum, the damaged, the forsaken, the dispossessed, the downtrodden, whatever you want to call them, that is what we have to get rid of. And you have a very strong movement called negative eugenics, picks up a lot of speed and a lot of people buy into it. They were not all kooks. A lot of them are very significant members of society, including Teddy Roosevelt, President of the United States, 
Margaret Sanger, many other philosophers and writers that you know of bought into eugenics in one form or another. So it was not some crazy left or right wing initiative. A lot of people bought into it and Davenport was aggressive in his headquarters in uh, uh, Long Island in New York, Cold Spring Harbor, setting up a think tank and an operation that is propagandizing eugenics, that this is for the betterment of the country, for the polity, and we're going to propagate those who have good germplasm and try to get rid of those who have bad or defective germplasm. So Davenport is a very key operative here, and he sets up programs and courses at universities around the country, including one that you guys are familiar with. In fact, I see you wearing t-shirts that say Penn State. Penn State was offering courses in eugenics in the 20s, in the 30s, as well as Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Northwestern. In fact, most of the major colleges, those that are considered at the very top today academically, bought into eugenics in a very strong way in the 1920s and the 1930s. So you have a lot of top professors, academic scholars, who are pushing into and buying into eugenics. More facilities, St. Vincent's is a orphanage in Northeast Philly. Woodbine is in South Jersey. The Iowa Soldiers and Orphans Home, obviously you know the state. And every state had institutions holding people who were somehow at that point considered defective considered to be suffering from defective germplasm. They are being kept in these institutions and they are constantly being beaten up because they're drawing a lot of money from the coffers of society. That a lot of money is being wasted on housing these individuals. And believe me, the lives of these individuals was not particularly good in any of these institutions. Polk is in Pennsylvania, Northwestern PA, Ohio Soldiers and Sailors and Orphans Home. All of these places that I'm naming there let their inmates out to doctors and researchers. Many of the top physicians that you are aware of and that you will find in your history books and your medical books went to these institutions to test their various elixirs, their various vaccines. This is a side of this story that you don't hear too often. Doctors like Jonas Salk, another term for them could be called microbe hunters, were ostensibly the best and the brightest of our society. That these were the great minds doing the great work solving medical mysteries that were going to enhance the welfare of the community. These guys did some great and brilliant work, but invariably the burden of that research was placed on individuals. One of the main pillars of this whole phenomenon is what I just described to you that we had devalued certain members of the, po of the population that should have been, arguably, the most protected of society. They were the most vulnerable. Children who had some sort of severe malady, defect, developmental problem were placed in these institutions, and these institutions tended to be on the bottom rung of society, and they were used repeatedly by researchers. These doctors knew not to go to Harvard or Yale or Penn State or any of the top prep schools that you guys are familiar with. They went to the very bottom. Why? Because they knew if they damaged somebody who had money and connections and education, it could be the end of their careers. However, if you damaged some of these individuals in these hell holes, 
in these state institutions that were always underfunded and lacking manpower and assistance and staff, it's more than likely that there's not going to be a negative repercussion. There's not going to be a lawsuit. There's not going to be a newspaper article. The other pillar is that during the same period, the early teens, the 1920s, the 1930s, there is an ethic that rises up that is really glorifying the triumphs of these great scientists. Somebody like Walter Reed, who was down in Cuba and South America fighting the yellow jack, fighting yellow fever. These diseases that had killed thousands of people over the years and decades were well known. And when a researcher came along doing groundbreaking work, they were held high. These people were as significant in being written up as Jack Dempsey, as Babe Ruth, as Bill Tilden, as Red Grange. They became phenomenal heroes of society. Here's an example of that. This is from the 1950s. That's not Beaver Stadium, but it is a significant stadium with a packed house. I believe it's in California. Could be UCLA or, or uh, Southern Cal. But you can see what the band is spelling out on the field. An example of the high regard these doctors receive because of their medical triumphs. What was not being told to the public, what was being kept secret and not written about, were that these great advances were on the backs of individuals and institutions, many of them children, at places like Letchworth Village and Vineland and the Ohio Sailors and Soldiers Home and things like that. So there are these two pillars that are holding up medical science one, devaluing a population that now can be used as test subjects and propping up doctors and researchers for doing the great work that they were doing. There's an individual who very few people know of today. His name is Paul de Cruff. He's long dead, but he helps Sinclair Lewis write a book in the mid-1920s, some of you have read it in high school or college. You may even seen the old movie. Who knows what I'm getting at? Anybody have an idea? Arrowsmith. Arrowsmith is a Sinclair Lewis book that wins all sorts of awards, a lot of plaudits, thousands, maybe millions of copies read. And it's about a researcher and his career and his dedication to fighting disease. Paul de Cruff was not the writer of it, but it was his idea and his information that went to Sinclair Lewis to write the book that comes out in 26. Paul de Cruff is a biologist. He works in uh, New York City at the Rockefeller Center, a great research center. And he's becoming a little bit disinterested with science and picking up the pen. He also wants to do some writing. And by working with Sinclair Lewis, that is only spurred further along. Then he is encouraged to write his own book. And he comes up with an interesting piece of subject matter. Paul de Kroof is going to write about some of the great scientists like Walter Reed and their great advances the great work that they have done that have saved the lives of millions of people. That book becomes a very big seller. So you have Arrowsmith, you have de Kroof's book, Microbe Hunters, and you have another book in 1926 that deals with the life of Dr. Osler, O-S-L-E-R, one of the great surgeons of American and British history. That wins, I believe, a Pulitzer as well. So in 1926, you have a trifecta of three major medical books that is really propelling medical research in the mindset of society. You then start to see comic books, not just being written about Spider-Man and Superman and other glorified, fictitious characters, but comic books coming out about real live heroes. 
So as I said, these two pillars are undergirding a system which could be called the perfect storm for individuals in institutions because more doctors are being encouraged to go into science and do research and they need test material. All of these doctors, whether they're dealing in psychology or they're dealing in virology or they're dealing in dermatology, you need test subjects. You may start out with rodents, rats, mice. You may advance to primates, such as monkeys and chimpanzees. But if you're going to put something on the market, you eventually have to use what? The real deal. You need humans. Where do you go to get humans that you can do some nasty things to? For example, sulk with polio. You were just as likely in the 1930s and 40s to give somebody polio as you were to triumph and find a vaccine because this is very heavy cerebral stuff. So where do the doctors generally go to test their stuff? Places like Letchworth Village that held individuals, near individuals, semi-individuals, that intervening link between monkeys and humans. Give you some examples. Dr. Walter Freeman, born in Philly, spends most of his academic career in Washington. His papers are now at George Washington Medical School. Dr. Freeman falls in love in 1938 with a new process, procedure to deal with mental illness. What is that? Lobotomy. Igaz Monez, a Portuguese physician, decides that there's a new way to tackle some of the dementia, mental problems that people are having, and that is to go into the brain and destroy portions of the brain. He writes about it, Freeman finds out about it, and he becomes a major devotee and propagandist. He runs around the country performing lobotomies. He and his partner do lobotomies in hospitals, and they think they're getting great results. The procedure, in Freeman's view, can be updated, made quicker, and he comes up with a new form of lobotomy himself called the prefrontal lobotomy, or transorbital lobotomy where he uses a, basically, an ice pick and goes through the eye socket and then starts destroying linkages in the brain, destroying the gray matter. And he thinks it's wonderful. Keep in mind, Freeman is not a surgeon. His partner, Dr. Watts, was the surgeon. Freeman was a neurologist. But Freeman thinks that this procedure, going into the brain, is so easy, so simple, so efficient and effective that he can do it himself. And in his office, he would do lobotomies. He would knock people out with an EKG, uh, excuse me, with, with uh, electroshock, light them up, knock them out, and then go through the eye socket with his metal uh, ice pick and destroy gray matter. And he's doing this from the late 30s into the 1960s. And he travels around the country propagating this mechanism, spending a lot of time going into institutions that hold all sorts of people with different types of, of mental maladies. But he thinks it's a, a, an elixir that will fix everything. And he does children. I found documents at George Washington where he's doing children as young as four, five, and six years old. Possibly some of these children would have come out of their various maladies on their own or with talk therapy or with something else less drastic than destroying a person's mind. But Freeman became such an advocate 
that he lost all perspective. And on one three-week trip into West Virginia, three weeks, he does 226 women. He lobotomizes 226 women in three weeks. Do the math yourself. How many is he doing a day? Hilary Kaprowski is a doctor who recently died. He was in his mid-90s. I interviewed him in his early 90s. Hilary Kaprowski is a famous scientist and one of the first to come up with a viable polio cure. And he is born in Poland, gets out of Europe at the beginning of the Second World War, goes off to Brazil, eventually gets to America, works for Letterly in the corporate sector. And he is working on polio, trying to come up with a vaccine, as many doctors are. And he thinks he's making great advances, and he is now ready to try it on humans. Where does he try it? Letchworth Village, a facility for children in New York State. And he gives them his vaccine, one of the first instances of a polio vaccine being given to children. He didn't give it to fellow scientists at his institution. He didn't give it to doctors or whatever at NYU or Columbia. Started with children in an institution uh, for the feeble-minded. Saul Krugman, another New York physician at NYU, brilliant virologist. He's interested in fighting hepatitis. He goes to Willowbrook, a very famous institution on Long Island holding several thousand individuals with all sorts of developmental and mental problems, many of them, maybe the bulk of them children, and he starts doing hepatitis studies. And a lot of these doctors did what is known as transmission studies. They, in fact, gave the feces of sick children with hepatitis, mashed it up, put it in cereal and in formula, and gave it to healthy children in other similar type of facilities. In this case, all of it was done at Willowbrook, where hepatitis-laced feces is mashed and mixed and given to healthy children who also have various developmental problems. Krugman is hailed today because he did some great groundbreaking work that separated the two different types of hepatitis. We learned more about how you get it, how it's transmitted, how you fight it. But once again, who was he working on and who did he use for that work? Children who could not defend themselves, did not know north from south, and one of the more controversial aspects of his research is that some of the parents were coerced. How were they coerced in letting their children be used this way as guinea pigs? Willowbrook was an overcrowded facility. When he goes in there, between four and 5,000 children in Willowbrook on Staten Island. Overcrowded, packed, they were turning parents away who wanted to give their children up. They could no longer deal with the various mental problems that they had. However, there was still room in the unit run by Saul Krugman. So if they would sign a document that allowed him to perform experiments on their children and basically give them hepatitis, their children would be accepted by Willowbrook. So think about it yourself. You have a child who's in bad shape. You can't deal with their physical or mental problem. You need an institution as a back backup to help. But the only way they will accept this child is if a doctor is allowed to give them hepatitis. Many parents bought into that. But there's a very significant coercion factor there. Krugman is honored today as a major virologist. He won a lot of awards. 
uh, held in very high regard at NYU and major institutions around the country, but there are folks at other institutions that say he practiced some of the best, worst medicine you could. Another doctor based here in Pennsylvania, Dr. Albert Kligman, very famous. Some of the women in the audience may know him because he invented Retin-A and Renova, very popular skin creams. He invented them, however, on the backs and faces of inmates in the Philadelphia prison system. Kligman was the one who ran the program that I mentioned earlier at Holmesburg, the House of Correction, and the Philadelphia Detention Center. He basically turned the Philadelphia prison system into a farm system for his research. He originally started working at Vineland and Woodbine in South Jersey, and then he comes into the Philly prison system and does all sorts of experiments. And his work was renowned, known around the country. And if you were an industrialist or you had a factory and you had a concern, you may end up contacting Kligman to do a piece of research for you. I could spend time going into this, but we have to move on. Would you say we have two more hours? <laughs> Ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, we're going to have a second section starting at 9.30, <laughs> and you can all come back after a quick break. Uh, but Kligman first starts to do experiments at Vineland and Woodbrine. These are institutions in South Jersey. Those of you from Jersey may know of them. And he would abrade the scalp of these children, four, five, six-year-old mentally retarded children. He would abrade their scalp till it's bloody, and then he would rub in microspore matawini and tinea capitis, the beginnings of ringworm and give the children wingworm. These children had enough problems already without giving them ringworm or what he also gave them, poison ivy, because he was interested in both of those, wanted to do work on it. The first thing you have to do is have people who have that dilemma, so kids who were reasonably healthy were given those maladies. He would follow up later using prisoners and using senior citizens. Loretta Bender. Another major medical figure. Uh, some of you guys are familiar with the Bender Gestalt studies. Dr. Uh, Bender is a major psychiatrist throughout the good portion of the 20th century, based at Bellevue Hospital in New York City and other New York City hospitals and facilities. And she believes that a lot of youngsters, in fact, almost every other kid she runs into who has a problem, suffers from childhood schizophrenia. And there's a clear remedy for that. What is it? Electroshock. So she starts laying down and sending electricity through the heads of five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids. Not once, not twice, but a batteries of 20 electroshocks. Very major figure. And as she was a devotee of electroshock in the 30s and 40s, Years later, in the 50s, she finds something else she thinks is a wonder drug. What is that? LSD. Okay? What does she do with it? She starts giving it to autistic children. If you look in medical journals, you will find articles by Bender where she is giving LSD to autistic children daily for months on end, in some cases over a year, in some cases twice a day. The biggest addict you know would never use LSD that often. As an adult, here she's giving it to young children, thinking that this may be some sort of panacea, some great elixir. Ted Shabasinski, who is still with us today, living on the West Coast, was a six-year-old boy who had some problems. He was shy. He was afraid of other children. Uh, you may call him a mama's boy, uh, but his mother had bigger problems than he did. She actually was schizophrenic and institutionalized. And because he was a little bit withdrawn, not like other children, he's put in Bellevue Hospital. Unfortunately, Dr. Bender becomes his physician. Bender thinks he has schizophrenia. She starts lighting him up with electroshock. And Ted is now considering writing his story. Now we have three good-looking guys there. They are not members of a rock group. Uh, these are graduates of Fernald. Fernald is an institution outside of Boston. 
that held those folks with developmental problems and mental retardation and what they called back then feeble-minded. And the handsome dude on the left-hand side with a hat on is our other guest, uh, Gordy Shattuck. Gordon Shattuck uh, was unfortunate enough to come from a dysfunctional family, a very large family, very large family. He was one of 21. He had a father who was big, aggressive, a short order cook, somebody who beat his children, beat his wife, did not take care of the family. The money that he earned went on alcohol, caused a lot of mayhem, and uh, did a lot of damage over the years. And uh, we'll talk about more about that shortly. This is a family on the West Coast back in the 1960s. This is the Dalmol Dal Dalmolin family. Uh, Karen Dalmolin is the uh, young girl in the center. Her brother Mark is on her uh, left-hand side there. And he was born with cerebral palsy. The family tried to take care of him. The young girls loved him, their brother. But the family was finally talked into putting him in an institution, which was the ethic back in the 40s and 50s. You get rid of problem children. You didn't take care of them. You put them in institutions. They put him in an institution, Sonoma State Hospital, for the feeble-minded at three. They get a call three years later. He's dead. What did he die of? He choked to death after a fever. Karen and the rest of the family is terribly distraught and upset, and there's a lot of recriminations, and it really blew the family apart. And years later, she still is troubled, starts to track down documents, gets information through the Freedom of Information Act and going to hospitals and whatever, and finds out that in actuality, Mark died of radiation poisoning. He was used in experiments by the Langley Porter Institute of the, Uni of the University of California at San Francisco by Nathan Malamud, a very famous uh, doctor who was doing research on children with cerebral palsy. This story here was actually featured on 60 Minutes. Uh, this book, Against Their Will, is a compilation of research that the Publisher insisted, we say a secret, but it's not so secret. In fact, you can go into medical journals and you will see these experiments that I just talked about. They were written up by the doctors, by the researchers, advocating, extolling, patting themselves on the back for the great work that they did. It's been out there for years. People haven't bothered to look at it or care about it. And maybe that's a mix of the ethic that dominated the 20th century, a little bit of elita, uh, elita, elitism, paternalism, utilitarianism. You use who you can and what you can. And doctors through most of the 20th century did just that. They knew where to go to do research on humans. When they had difficulty getting monkeys during the Second World War because they were too expensive or they couldn't be shipped from Africa, they went to the institutions that held damaged children or other vulnerable populations. Over and over, when you go through the documents at various archives and repositories, you find instances of doctors writing to each other about work they're doing, the research, how it's coming, where are we going to get test subjects. We don't have money for more monkeys. What do we do? And they start talking about going to various institutions that have let us done this work before, may let us do it again, so forth and, and so on. Doctors at major institutions like Yale contacting doctors at Penn, we need 1,500 subjects for a clinical trial. We know you've had access to the population at Pennhurst in southeastern Pennsylvania. Would you help us do this clinical trial there? This is the underbelly of American medicine. Yes, great work has been done, such as Jonas Salk and Krugman and what have you, but many of these experiments have been saddled on the backs of some of the weakest and most infirm and most in need of protection. 
There may be some in this audience around the country that think that's a fine use for some of these people. You may have a predisposition towards eugenics where you use the least of us to help the best of us. I'm not going to say that it doesn't exist there. I've had students in my classes who felt that we should use uh, prisoners, particularly the ones who are murderers, who are rapists, who do the most foul, offensive crimes. We should use them as experimental material. But there may be others of you who feel it should not be done that way. There should be some other system, ethical system, that spreads the burden and does it in a way that people know what they're getting into. Gordon Shattuck was a young boy who already had significant troubles from a dysfunctional family and what have you, but he's caught up in initiative. And who is it led by? You may have heard of these institutions. Harvard and MIT come into Fernald along with the private sector, Quaker Oats, and the government to do experiments. And they are used as experimental material. Gordon, very quickly. When were you born, Gord? 1937. 1937. You were born in where? You weren't born at, at Fernell. I was born in Marblehead. Marblehead, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And how many kids were in your family? 21. You're pulling our leg. No. Really, 21 kids. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the household like besides crowded? It was bad, you know, we had to go out and get food for the house, me and my sister. I mean, we were only seven, eight years old, and we used to steal the money off the papers when they used to drop it off. And Your mother and father couldn't feed you? No, because he had the refrigerator loaded up with beer. So he was a good drinker? Oh, okay. And your mother couldn't uh, save uh, any food or any of that money? No. They, they got in fights because, it, you know, she did, you know, try to get him to go out and get food for the house, you know, because the kids, we were, we were hungry. And he said he would, you know, but he'd bring home beer instead and start drinking and then start beating us all up and uh, Did he beat and, your mother? Well he beat her bad, yeah. He he beat it one night, my sister Jenny, me, and my sister Dottie. We were all in the kitchen crouched down, you know, side by side. And my mother got a razor blade and started going like that. And, and she laid on the floor, and there was a big puddle of blood. She tried to commit suicide. Yeah. And you're right there to see it. Yeah, there's nothing I could do. So, uh, I don't know who called the cops, but the, the cops came, and the ambulance, and you know. And so they opened the refrigerator, you know, and they seen nothing but beer, and they says, where's the food for the kids? Oh, we, we don't have the money for it, you know? Well, you could go down to welfare, and they would help you out. In fact, the doctor that brought us all into the world lived down the bottom of the street, down the hill. <laughs> Did they send you to school, Gordon? No, never, never, had, didn't go never to school. had any school. Eventually, the state takes you out of the house, right? Yeah, uh, from the state house. They, they sent two social workers. And, and where'd they put you? They took us up to the state house. And then they found foster homes. For so you were in foster homes for a while. Did you like that? No. Yeah, we used to run, I used to run away all the time. And after the foster homes, did they send you where? After the foster homes? Yes. Oh, they, they, they sent me to this where I ended up in the front of school. But before that, you were at other institutions. 
boys. Oh, yeah, I was in a Catholic school in Boston. In fact, MIT, you could see right up top really? the building. And it was like a sister's uh, place. You have, and, and then what happened? They took you to Fernald. Yeah, they took, they took us to Fernald. How old were you? Oh, uh, I, they, when they put me in there, it was 1949. Okay. Yeah. And what was that like? What did you see in Fernald? It was awful up there, I'll tell you. What kind of people did they have in there? Oh, they had awful. The, the, the people that worked there, they used to rape us. They did everything to us. They raped the children? Oh, yeah. They used to take us in the, like this room. We used to watch TV in it, across, this would be across the hall. And then the tenants, employee, you know, employment guy, he, he, he'd take him in, take him in there and rape him. And this was a I facility? I know because they did it to me more than once. And you were about how old? Uh, I was about seven, something like Did that. Did you have anybody that uh, you could talk to about this, that you could complain to? No, nobody would listen. Why? And everybody was scared to say something because we would get beat up or something. Did they, they give you an education? Did you go to school? No, never got any education. The only thing they made us do was go to workshops and make brooms and uh, repair shoes and work on woven machines. So things that would keep the institution going, yeah, you did right. that work? We used to. Did they pay you? No. You did that work for nothing? Yeah. Why? Because you're a good guy? No, we had to. <laughs> you had to. Did you have to work out in the field in the summer? Yeah, all summer. In the hot, hot heat and everything. From early in the morning until five or six. But eight, they eight. taught you how to read? No, they never taught me how to read. Never taught you how to Did they teach you anything about money? No, I didn't know nothing about money. So you were having a good time there? Yeah, I was having a ball. Tell us about the, uh, on top of all this, you had the great luck to be incorporated in something called the Science Club. What was that? Oh, yeah. Well, there was scientists that came from MIT, I guess, and Harvard and those places. And they, because they had all those white robes on. The white lab coats. Yeah. And they had a list, and my name was the, the first one. And they, uh, 20 of us, they took for the test. And they put us separate from the kids in the other, uh, you know, the other place. And what did they say to you? They said, uh, well, if you go in the science club and help us out on this, we'll take you to ball games, the Red Sox, we'll see, you see the Boston Braves, you know, and... So they would take you out of the institution once in a while, did you like that? Yeah, I loved it. But... <coughs> And then uh, MIT we took us up to their place, you know, in, in the place where What they, did they make you do on a daily basis in the science club? Well, they made us urinate in a bottle and stool in another bottle. So every and day? they used to take blood from us every day. So you're having blood draws every day and you were uh, peeing and defecating in bottles. Was that nice? No. No, you didn't like that. No. And they're isolating you from other children and what have you? <clears throat> yeah, I refused to test after a while and I didn't want to do it because I, I didn't think it was, it was something wrong, you know. You didn't I like just, it anymore? No, I, I thought it was something that it would hurt us and I was right. So, so the guys, they, they let you quit the program? No, they didn't let me. They, what happened? They put me in jail. They brought me down to 22, was called the jail. They had bars and all that. That's a, that's a, a room or a facility in well, the institution? They threw, me, they threw me in a secluded... Uh, in seclusion, and, and what did they do there? 
They just isolated well, you. They kept you in there until yeah, you would change they, your mind. Yeah, that's right. They, and, they, they used to say every day, are you ready to go back and, and finish the test? And I said, no. And then after a while, it got, you know, I, I says, what's better, doing this or go and get the test and get it over? So they so deceive you. They deceive back. you and put you in a in a experimental program. Never tell you or your parents exactly what's going on. Then when you say you want out, they say no, sir. No. And but and you're still how old at this point? Twenty-five, thirty. Hmm. How old were you? Oh, I was about. <coughs> About seven years old, seven or eight, something like that. And when did you finally find out what was going on in that experiment? I, I never really found out. It's just that I thought it was something that, you know, you had to urinate in a bottle and they take blood from me all the time. And that needle was like that, for God's sake, it was a, oh. Were you the like only? Were you, were you the only child that wandered out of the program? Yeah, I, the, the other kids did too. They were going to follow me, but they they didn't. They were scared. You know, they were afraid they were going to get beat up and all that. But and I, how did you finally find out what happened? What was going on? I don't know. Um, When you learned what the testing, what happened when the media came to your house? What had happened to start oh, that? Oh yeah, the, the, the Herald, the Globe, and all them. They, 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 the word got out. This lady was working at the Fernal, and she got all the records and all that and all this stuff. What happened was that a woman named Sonny Marlowe, who worked in the library at Ferneld, and they had a very significant eugenics library at Ferneld found paperwork illuminating these experiments had taken place from the mid-40s to the 1960s. And children almost every year were incorporated in studies, some very significant Cold War studies, particularly at Rentham and other institutions like Fernald. That occurs in 93. It becomes front page news, particularly in the Boston area. And that's when the media started coming to uh, Gordon's uh, door asking for interviews. And that's the first time they learned that what was going on with those experiments was that the doctors from Harvard and MIT and uh, Quaker Oats were putting radioactive isotopes in the morning breakfast cereal, in the oatmeal that these children ate every morning. And that was kept secret. And that is another example of what I have been talking about here. All of you guys know those institutions, MIT and Harvard, very bright, cerebral people. And it's in a town, Boston, you know, it's almost as nice as State College. They've got schools there, they've got universities, they've got prep schools, but they didn't use those. They traveled 40 minutes outside the city and went to an institution that was known as the Ferreld State School for the Feeble-Minded. Why? Because these individuals were not worth as much at the kids at St. Paul's, at Hotchkiss, and some of these other fancy boarding schools. You can't touch those children. You can't damage those children. They come from money and influence and connections and education. We're going to go where they have children that are more like animals than people. And that's what they did. And I would be very happy to say that's a lone instance. But in fact, it is not. And if you read this book, you will see numerous examples of doctors in all fields going to institutions just like this to do their research. Some of it was psychological and messed up these kids for a long time. In other instances, it was uh, serious invasive medical procedures and virology and things like that.
So I think I have overextended, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nikolai, who's going to direct uh, the next part. But I want to thank you guys for sitting here, listening to this, and maybe some of you will be spurred on to uh, do some good investigative research on your own, because there are still a lot of stories buried out there that need to be illuminated. So thank you. Yeah, I got a learning disability. I can't. That's why I never got all, got through life without labor. You know, hard labor. That's all I could do. Pick and shovel, whatever. You know. And my my son has got it. He he can't work. It's the same thing. My daughter. So it's been a tough life, huh, Gord? Let me, let me uh, interject something here, and this is the right place to do it, right place geographically, and I think you guys will all relate to this. Over the last year or two, there has been a hell of a storm with regard to some supposedly and maybe documented nefarious activity at Penn State with some major figures like Sandusky and Paterno and the former president and what have you, and it has received national attention and certainly hurt the brand of Penn State. And I bring that up because while all that was happening and all that news was dominating TV, certainly in Pennsylvania, I'm writing this book. And I'm writing page after page, maybe sentence after sentence, about this whole history of children being used and abused on a regular basis from the top institutions in the country. Over and over, the government is funding this stuff, major academic institutions and think tanks and doctors and medical hospitals, going to institutions that held children, held children that are being used as, as sweat hogs, I mean, they were taken out of their families. They're put in these places. You think they're going to be protected, but no. They're not educated. They come out of there at 18 or 20. They can't read. They don't know a, a dime from a dollar. They can't take a bus. Their skills are very limited to making brooms. That's what was done, not even mentioning the abuse, the beatings, the rapes. And on top of that, kids like Gordner uses test subjects as guinea pigs. Nobody was writing about that, illuminating that, that went on in every state. But it happens at Penn State with a major icon, football coach, and all hell breaks loose. You would think there was a long tradition of concern. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And that's where there's a lot of, of uh, duplicity and uh, you know, uh, hypocrisy for sure that uh, the vulnerable in this country, be they black sharecroppers in Macon County, be they prisoners in Philly, be they geriatrics in South Jersey, what have you, that was the name of the game. And the only people who didn't know it were folks like yourself. But people in research all knew it. They knew where to go. They knew what doctors had access to these facilities and you could make a lot of money if you were a medical director at one of these institutions, loaning out your people as research material, which is what they were called, material. If you're talking about 1937, 1943, 1952, I think it would be a one-day story. And in fact, it may not have been a story because most people bought into the mindset, the ethic, that these individuals are weighing us down. That eugenics movement really was far more pervasive than we give it credit for. Some of us know that there were instances of it, and we know it really ran wild in Nazi Germany, but in fact, Hitler learned it from America. I have documents 
and some of them were actually in the first version of the book. The book was much cut down by the publisher, unfortunately, where Hitler and his top deputies were thanking American physicians and people like Charles Benedict for propagating eugenics and initiating various programs of which Hitler bought into and expanded. So you guys, it, it would pay you to take a look at the eugenics movement and recognize how widespread and deep it was in this country. And there's some very good books on the subject. And what I'm arguing is that mindset of devaluing and minimizing the worth of damaged people, if I can use that term, helped the doctors who were striving to be the microbe hunters. You know, they wanted humans they could work on and not have to worry about, and they found them in these institutions. So it fit, it all went together. And, you know, it, it, it's remarkable when you look at, you know, you go into a good medical library, or even online, you can get into some of these journals, and you look at the articles, and you look at where the experiments were taking place. And if you're on the ball, you will go to the end of the article. It's normally at the beginning or at the end when they're describing the experiment. They will either mention it up front or in the back where they give thanks to the superintendent of Letchworth Village for the feeble-minded for allowing us to use their facility. And, you know, it, it, it's out there. And uh, this is a fairly new field. Some of you may want to be a bioethicist or what have you. Uh, but there's a lot of work yet to be done on this. Uh, Bad Blood about Tuskegee comes out in 78-79. Uh, uh, Susan Letterer comes out with Subjected to Science about 93-95. My book, Acres of Skin, comes out in 98. In 2000s, we have a few more books that come out, but there's still stuff buried out there. I mean, it was only a year or two ago where a researcher from Wellesley, I believe, Susan Reverby, is doing research at the University of Pittsburgh and discovers that American doctors went to Guatemala and used children, prisoners, and soldiers in syphilis experiments, actually giving them syphilis, okay? That was just discovered a couple years ago. Secret all of that time from, this, from 46, 47 when the experiment took place to just a couple years ago. Well, it is not nearly as bad as what it was during the first 75 years of the 20th century. Things have greatly been cleaned up for the better. Doctors, as they complain, have to jump through hoops now. They've got to go through IRBs. They've got to go through all of these things they don't really want to do. But there are still indiscretions. There are still uh, efforts to avoid some of these things. They, there is still some risky behavior. And I'll give you one example, or maybe a couple of examples. Uh, as we're meeting here right now, it's very likely that there is some institution or a set of institutions that's working on children, giving them anthrax. A year ago, the President's Commission on Bioethics decided that it was okay to do anthrax experiments on children. I believe that any day now, or six months from now, or a year from now, there will be a headline in a paper, a half a dozen children are discovered to have died from anthrax because of their involvement in this. Another example that recently happened, where at a number of major hospitals around the country, east coast, west coast, in the middle, were involved in oxygenation studies of preemies, premature infants being born, greatly at risk, and oxygen can help save them, but if you give too much or too little, it could either blind them or kill them. As it turns out, 250 out of 1,300 children in this study did die. And the problem is that the parents of these kids were not quite told everything they should have been informed of. That too much or too little oxygen could have these negative repercussions. 
And this happened not at some backwoods hospital, but major teaching hospitals in America. Okay, nobody blew the whistle on it. None of the nurses, none of the doctors recognized that what they were doing was wrong. So examples still take place out there where people can get damaged, okay? So it is better, but it's not Simon Pure by a long stretch. Well, I may comment on just about all of these experiments, like the one that was done at Fernell with Gordy. They never, you know, uh, had the kids, you know, sign anything. Like, first of all, they couldn't read. They were deceived. They were hit with inducements. They were punished when they tried to get out of it. And the parents were never told. You know, most parents did not receive anything. Some were sent a letter that, you know, we're trying to do some research here. You think, we think your son will benefit by it. Never, never told them that they were having radioactive isotopes put in their breakfast cereal. How many of you start the day with cornflakes with radioactive isotopes? Raise your hand. I mean, you just put milk or strawberries in your, in your uh, cereal and, and not radioactive isotopes? So yes, informed consent is a very big part of it. And that has evolved over years, OK? Uh, it did not, the concept did not exist back in the 30s and 40s. And uh, it, it's interesting, I, I spoke at another campus of Penn State. I was asked to talk about a, a few of my books to a group of uh, Dutch scholars that were in America visiting universities. And uh, they were astounded to hear about acres of skin and using prisoners as test subjects. Why? Because America is the nation that put the Nazis on trial. America is the nation that wrote the Nuremberg Code. The problem is we left the code over there. It didn't come back here. Doctors didn't want to buy into it. And many of the doctors that I interviewed, some of these guys that are dead now because they go back to the 1940s and 50s, they told me they didn't know of it. It wasn't a big deal. In fact, you can still go into medical schools today into bookstores at medical schools, and you won't see any ethics books. You won't see mine, you won't see Susan Letterer's, you won't see Jonathan Marino's, you know? It really, ethics is really the bastard child of the academic community. And that's one of the things that, that makes the Rock Institute uh, interesting and worthy of some applause, because not that many universities you know, give it such credence. And that's another of the ironies that Penn State's getting this bad reputation for what happened, you know, with these children under Sandusky. But in other ways, we've, you know, some, some good things have been done here. You could argue a lot of good things. But many schools, you know, it, it's, it really is an afterthought ethics. In his mind, he did. He felt that lobotomy greatly helped the individuals that he operated on. But he also admits in his documents that there has not been any noticeable benefit, that we may have to operate again, that the individual is now institutionalized and probably never will get out. There's a very good book on the subject. You should read it. You'd find it interesting, called The Lobotomist. Okay? And it's by Jack L. High, E-L-H-A-I, The Lobotomist. A very good account of Freeman's life and his work and his damage. I mean, he was, he was doing lobotomies on four, five, six, seven-year-old kids. You know, I mean, a lobotomy is something you do not come back from. According to my reading of history and documents, there is a landmark change in the mid-70s, and it basically rides on the back of Tuskegee. The Tuskegee syphilis study is revealed after 40 years, and people are stunned, they are shocked. And people start to recognize, well, you know, we've got that mental hospital down the road. I think they've been doing some stuff there. And somebody else will say in Illinois, you know, at uh, uh, Stateville, I think I saw some doctors doing experiments there. And in California, you know, at Sonoma State, they've had children, I think they're doing stuff there. It was really the shot heard around the world. And the reason why it was so receptive is because in 
the 60s, you had all these other movements that are taking place. You have the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the environmental movement. You happy I said that, Jonathan? Uh, all of these movements are coming around and they are sensitizing people to things that they had not thought about before. So when Tuskegee comes down, boom, it really helps remold the intellectual and emotional landscape and you start to see doctors and universities and hospitals being kicked out of institutions that they once freely walked in the front door. But prior to that, those first 75 years, you could do whatever you wanted. Well, not to the researchers. Not to the researchers. Most of them got off scot-free. Let's say Kligman. Kligman used senior citizens, institutionalized, used children, institutionalized, used prisoners, institutionalized. He used everybody. If somebody wasn't looking, he'd use you. You know, he was an equal opportunity user. And he got a lot of contracts from both the military and the private sector. People in the business of doing research knew who to go to and where to go. I mean, I can tell you about initiatives, concerns in Maryland, North Carolina with the tobacco industry, Dow Chemical in Michigan. Where did they come? They came to Philly. Why did they come to Philly? Because we had bandstand, because we had the Uptown Theater, you know, because we had Sonny Jurgensen throwing passes at Tommy McDonald? No, because we had Kligman and Penn and the prison. That triumvirate of test subjects, doctor, major institution, the military came, Dow came, R.J. Reynolds came, please do a piece of clinical research for us. We will give you this much money. They have been forced to change. They can't do what they did, certainly not as freely. There may still be some unethical people who are trying, but the penalties are greater now. More people are watching now. IRBs have done a lot to try and rectify the system, but some of those IRBs are dominated by people who want to see research go through. So the, adv the, the advice I would give is be vigilant, ever vigilant. Oh yeah, there was, there was a few people that really, you know, they had to do it without anybody else knowing it, you know. But uh, Mr. Bellador, I can remember, he was a, he was a teacher, believe it or not, uh, in uh, uh, grade five. Of course, we never went there, but that's what he was teaching. <clears throat> and he used to get, bring in stuff for me, cigarettes or, you know, anything I wanted. He, he was a good, good person. He, you know, he tried to make us a little happy, you know, not much to be happy for, but... I mean, there was thousands of kids, and they were all being mistreated and everything. They broke all kinds of rules, you know. And it was all hush-hush, you know, that's why it never got out. They did a pretty good job of that. Gordon and some of his guys did retain legal counsel, and they did win some money. I'm not sure, it may have been a neighborhood of twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a person. There are other examples in Oregon and Washington State in the 1960s, prisoners in those states were used in radiation studies where they irradiated the testicles of inmates. The inmates, I think, were given something like $5 a month to sit in a tub of water and have their testicles irradiated. Does that sound pretty exciting, guys? No? Uh, well, they eventually retained legal counsel and they won in the neighborhood of thirty dollars or $40,000 a piece. But the guys in Philadelphia, the inmates there, also retained legal counsel. The counsel wasn't that great, and they paid for it. Uh, the judges ruled that the uh, statute of limitations expired. They couldn't sue, so they couldn't get anything. And those experiments in Philadelphia 
Some of them were fairly innocuous, wouldn't bother you. Others were pretty outrageous. They put radioactive, they were injected with radioactive isotopes in their backs and shoulders. They had dioxin placed on their faces and backs. They uh, went through many other, you know, nasty phase one experiments dealing with chemical warfare agents for the Army and the CIA. They got zip. So their attitude is, first we got screwed by the doctors and then we got screwed by the lawyers. So it varies. And it depends on the jurisdiction, how long it took, how good your lawyering was. And there are many people, the vast majority in fact, still do not know they were used. There are, there are many instances that you will read in the book where infants were irradiated, their thyroids were irradiated, just so the doctors could test the impact of radiation. In the aftermath of World War II, in the aftermath of Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, tremendous interest in atomic science, and at a number of places around the country, they are irradiating two and three and four day old infants. And there's a very good likelihood that many of those children ended up with, some ve with severe cancers and death. All in the name of science. All in the name of additional knowledge. Please join me in thanking Alan and Jordan.